Air travel into the north has increased greatly in recent years. In the past, it little difference when certain of our flat maps showed polar areas, such as Greenland, much larger than the United States. But with today's Earth-spanning flights, we must show the world's land and sea areas in their proper proportions. The globe does this. The longer the flights become, the more we find that direct routes require actually crossing the Arctic regions, where conditions are vastly different from those we know and entirely foreign to most people's experiences. A few hours north by plane gets us far over Manitoba province, on the very edge of the Arctic, usually called the subarctic. Churchill lies in Canada, about halfway up the west coast of Hudson Bay. It's mid-June when we glide in above Churchill for a landing. Yet the river below us is still solidly frozen. First, we alight and unload our equipment. Then, as we look out over Hudson Bay, the huge jumbled piles of ice still remaining in June remind us that the subarctic is a place of long winters and short summers. Only yesterday, two polar bears were seen on this pack ice, having hitchhiked south. Nearby, barren grounds caribou, the deer of the Arctic, spend the winter. In early spring, they move northward into the treeless tundra. Without this important source of meat, no Eskimos could live in the Arctic interior. Here at Churchill, we are on what is called the tree line. This is not a sharp line, but rather a strip many miles wide in some places. From Churchill, it follows an irregular northwest route, crossing the Mackenzie River mouth and passing through northern Alaska. South of this belt, the trees grow fairly large and in heavy, dense forests. As we cross the tree line northward, we find fewer trees of smaller and smaller size. Finally, all trees disappear as the permanently frozen tundra, or zone of permafrost, stretches on to the Arctic Ocean. Under these stunted tree-lined spruces, we find two kinds of tough, woody Labrador tea growing. The small-leaved one grows commonly on the treeless tundra to the north. The large-leaved one grows in the spruce woods to the south. Thick mats of gray-green reindeer moss cover much of the gravelly soil. This is really a lichen, one of the foods of the caribou. The largest willows are only knee-high at the tree line. A little Richardson's willow, blooming near a snowbank, resembles our pussy willows. Other willows grow flat on the rocks, turning up only the tips of their twigs to produce leaves and flowers. Many Arctic plants resemble their more southern relatives, but the severe weather causes these Arctic species to grow much smaller, although many have brilliantly colored blossoms. The orange five finger, for instance, displays these Arctic characteristics of bearing small, bright flowers. One of the tiniest plants blossoming near Churchill is this saxifrage. Each blossom is only one-fourth of an inch across, and the leaves are so tiny they can hardly be recognized as leaves. This reminds us of a New England daisy field. 
It's really the Arctic Avens, one of the most abundant flowering plants of the far north. It may grow in almost any niche in the rocks where a little soil collects. The dainty Arctic moccasin flower blooms about midsummer. It's surprisingly similar to the little white lady slipper of northern United States, but it's much smaller. The Lapland rhododendron is a close relative of the beautiful azaleas, which grow in the near tropical gardens of southern United States. In some places, the rhododendron transforms the tundra into what we might think of as a sub-arctic garden. Near the rhododendrons, settling quietly on her nest, is a ptarmigan in summer dress. This subarctic species is the willow ptarmigan. It has a remarkably concealing color pattern which almost perfectly repeats the colors of the surrounding moss and twigs. During the winter, this bird is equally well concealed by a snow white plumage. Its successful survival depends upon this wonderfully adapted year-round color pattern. Even the eggs will often escape notice because of their speckled pattern. The spring color change comes more slowly in the male, giving him a rich brown head and neck during the courtship period. Quite different from the mottled hen. This colorful arctic grouse is an important food of the white fox, which as a fur bearer is so essential to the Eskimo. The ptarmigan has kept alive many Indians, Eskimos, and white men, serving as their food as they traveled and explored in this bleak north country. Many shorebirds, such as the semi-palmated plover, come from the far south each summer to raise their young in this tundra country. They like to wade and feed along the shores. We might say that this plover showed good taste when it chose to nest near a colorful rhododendron. The lesser yellow legs is one of the migrant shorebirds best known in the United States. In spring and fall, we frequently see small flocks stopping along muddy flats and shores. Here in the nesting territory, these birds commonly perch unsteadily on spruce tree tops, voicing their objections to intruders who venture near their nests. During migration, however, such treetop perching is entirely unknown. One of the smallest shorebirds is the northern phalarope. Unlike other shorebirds, the phalaropes have flaps on their toes, which enable them to swim like miniature ducks. Often they spin around in the water, their churning feet disturbing small water life, which the birds pick off for food as it rises to the surface. Hudsonian godwit is large and noisy. Wonderfully strong on the wing, this big waiter spans nearly half the globe on migration flights. Together with the golden plovers, ready turnstones, and a few others, the godwits leave Churchill in the fall, take off over water from Nova Scotia, and fly south across the Atlantic to South America. They winter in Argentina, sometimes ranging to the southern tip. In the spring, they again cross the equator, flying northward to their nesting grounds on the subarctic tundra. Immediately upon arrival, they begin their nesting, since their downy chicks must hatch and grow strong during the short summer 
for the long flight to South America. In a stunted little spruce, still packed in mid-June snowdrifts, we find a sparrow-like red pole just completing her thick, warm nest. The male appears to be giving suggestions, but very little help. She lines the nest with willow catkin fibers to provide a soft, warm home for the eggs and young. These hardy, goldfinch-sized birds with their little red caps appear in northern United States only in winter. The little, almost tailless lemming is perhaps even more important than the ptarmigan as food for Arctic animal life. These colored lemmings become very numerous, usually every fourth year, when they provide abundant food for foxes, wolves, hawks, and owls. Then, for reasons not well understood, the lemmings die off, and the predatory animals are hard-pressed to find sufficient food. It's now the 4th of July and we still see snowdrifts three feet or more deep in the Churchill area. Two weeks have passed since we visited the willow ptarmigans. Notice how the male is rapidly changing his body feathers to a dark plumage for the summer. The hen has just hatched her speckled eggs, but her family of downy chicks faces a cold world well protected. Their little legs and feet are feathered to the claws, as though they wore heavy, woolly stockings. The chicks' colors seem to blend with their surroundings even better than does the hen's color pattern. Notice how hard it would be to find these chicks if they chose to sit motionless. Usually very careful, the ptarmigan mother will make mistakes, but no harm done. Now we'll leave the tundra and go to the town of Churchill. Its white residents are mostly Icelanders and Scandinavians. Chippewaian Indians also live here. Churchill looks like a typical western prairie town with low, simple buildings and no trees. This huge elevator receives western grain by rail for ocean shipment to Europe. Burly sledge dogs tethered among tundra boulders remind us that we are really on the fringe of the Arctic. By July, the harbor ice is out and this Hudson's Bay Company supply boat loads cargo for northern posts on Hudson Bay. A whaling station near Churchill processes the belugas, or small white whales. A plane flight over the bay near the mouth of the Churchill River gives one some idea of the abundance of these whales. Indians harpoon the whales and tow them alongside motor-driven canoes to the whaling station. Like all the true whales, they are not fish, but air-breathing mammals. Until practically full-grown, young white whales are gray. Nearby lies Fort Churchill, the headquarters for United States and Canadian Arctic Armed Forces. This joint enterprise is concerned with testing cold weather equipment, experimenting with new machines for land travel, perfecting planes for air transportation,
and in learning other ways to live and work in this northern land of expanding importance. As we prepare to leave Fort Churchill, we must remember that even though the subarctic is a land of long, cold, bleak winters, this visit has shown us that it is also a land of surprising color, of life and living, of growing activity. The true Arctic regions lie still farther north to the Arctic Circle and beyond. Conditions there are even more severe and survival even more difficult. Travel still farther into the north than us, this story. <laughs>